Okay, okay. good. So, yes, I'm Maria, and uh, I'm working on characterization of uh, hydraulic and physical properties of the media. And uh, in the subsurface, we have both uh, porous and fractured media that could be pretty heterogeneous, meaning that uh, the flow can be really channelized. And in general, temperature data could help us to characterize this uh, groundwater flow and um, especially uh, DTS-based investigation techniques could help us to get the distribution of hydraulic properties and also of thermal properties of this medium. So I will just present you in general very briefly how temperature is distributed in the subsurface. So in the absence of groundwater flow, what we have is that temperature increases with depth by 2-3 degrees every 100 meters, and it's called geothermal gradient. And then we also have the temperature of the surface that varies with time, so we have uh, that then the signal can propagate uh, downward, and uh, the depth of propagation depends on the frequency of the signal, so seasonal and daily variations will attenuate to depth of 10 meters, and then longer term variation can propagate to the greater depth. And we also have uh, groundwater flow that will completely redistribute all these temperatures. So in recharge zone, we have uh, cold water that can infiltrate. In discharge zone, we have relatively warm water of deeper origin that uh, go up to the surface. And we will see this if we measure temperature profiles. So the temperature profiles in these zones will basically deviate from the geothermal gradient. So as I said, as Mm, subsurface is generally very heterogeneous. This heterogeneity in hydraulic properties will also impact the propagation of thermal signal. So basically, uh, it means that in low permeable media, we will see mainly the heat transport by conduction, while in um, higher permeable media, we will see also advection uh, that will propagate the temperature in a more rapid way. And we will also um, we, we will also be able to detect this contrast in permeability by measuring temperature in a passive manner, uh, and if we conduct different experiments under different flow conditions, we even be able to detect sometimes the distribution of hydraulic properties just by measuring temperature in a passive way. So if we have this water. Mm, like flowing zones, bringing water to the borehole uh, from shallower origin or deeper origin, we will be able to see these um, inflections in the temperature profile that can be useful to detect inflows in passive manner. But sometimes if we have these flowing zones that are sub-horizontal or, um, for example, if the flow through these zones is not strong enough, we will not see this, um, this uh, basically... Uh, inflections will be too small to help us to detect inflows. And in this case, uh, we can use active methods. Could you still hear me, just to be sure? Hello? Go ahead and unmute us for a moment. Hi, Maria. We, we can hear you. What's up? Okay, it, it, just, just to be sure, because I didn't see anything. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we, we, so... Uh, in this case, we use active methods, so it means that we basically change the temperature of the borehole simply by heating the cable inside the borehole or by injecting the water of contrast temperature to increase the sensitivity to groundwater flow. So then we measure the temperatures in the borehole uh, during the heating period and then during the cooling period. And obviously, if we have some flowing zones, uh, the um, temperature will recover faster. Uh, just in front of this cooling zone, and it will recover in, with some uh, velocity corresponding to the diffusive process if we don't have any uh, flowing zones. Uh, so I will just show you this example from a Grimsel test site, which is the, an underground laboratory in Swiss Alps now. So it's a fractured aquifer, fractured uh, rock. And the idea, was, so we conducted an experiment in there a few years ago, and the idea was to create a, a small-scale geothermal prototype. And the first phase of this experiment was simply to characterize the rock mass. So in there, we have uh, two fault zones. 
uh, intersects and just at the location of the site. And we drilled uh, 15 boreholes towards the fault zones in order to characterize them because afterwards we wanted to stimulate them with a high pressure. And we can, uh, so one of the phases of the experiment was to conduct these thermal uh, experiments in order to characterize the rock mass. And we conducted them in two boreholes of 50 meter depth. So, and just to let you know that we are working in a very low permeable environment. It is something similar that we can find at the depth of a few kilometers to be close to the real EGS conditions. Uh, so how we deploy the fiber optic cable. So we have these blue PVC pipes in here on the photo and we attach the fiber optic cables to these blue pipes. Uh, so this is the bottom piece, basically, that allows us not to bend the fiber optic cable and not to break it. And we, also can, we can also inject the hot water through the bottom of this uh, PVC pipe and to replace the water in the borehole. So we conducted the test on the unbent flow conditions, and then we also put the packer in the neighboring borehole. So the distance in between them is about uh, six meters. And then through this packer, we can inject the water, the tap water, in order to pressurize this borehole and basically create the additional flow in between these wells if they are connected. So the results are here, the results of uh, DTS measurement. So we have depth, we have time in here, and uh, color code corresponds to temperature. So we started to replace the water at this moment. Uh, so the ambient water temperature is around 12 degrees, and then we inject the, uh, the warm water at 35 degrees from the bottom. And after two hours, we replaced all the water in the borehole with something going from 23 degrees at the top up to 35 at the bottom. And we stopped the injection of hot water and we observe how the temperature recovers. So here there is nothing too much interesting. It's pretty homogeneous, meaning that most probably we don't see any enhanced flow zones uh, from this experiment. And this is the relative temperature anomaly. We can also see that it's pretty homogeneous, except the upper part where there is probably convection and also some exchange with the air in the tunnel. And then we put this packer system. So we pressurize the borehole up to four bars. And what we can see is that here there is, so it's exactly the same experiment. Here we see this zone of enhanced cooling, which probably means that we have this flowing zone that connects to borehole on this relative temperature anomaly, so normalized temperature. And then we check this, we verify this with the independent measurements of uh, transmissivity that we uh, transmissivity profile from this borehole. And indeed, we can see at this depth of 24 meters that there is a most transmissive fracture, which is about 10 to the minus 5 meters square per second. So we can detect uh, cross-flowing uh, fractures, even in such low permeable media. And also from all other depths where we don't have any fractures, we can extract many temperature transients. So one of them is here. And these temperature transients we also can use in order to deduce thermal properties of the media, which is very important for geothermal applications. So we adapted an analytical solution in order to interpret these transients. And uh, then we can extract uh, from 45 meter depth borehole around 180 depth, uh, temperature transients. And inverse them uh, to deduce the thermal conductivity profile all along the well. So all these black points, it's in situ measurements of thermal properties. And we also checked uh, with independent measurements in the lab on small samples that uh, we have a very good um, agreement in between lab measurements and in situ measurements of thermal properties. <clears throat> We also made, um, can perform similar experiments in porous media uh, with a similar principle, but the difference uh, with porous media that we have an advantage to be able to apply direct push technology, uh, which allows us to put the cable in direct contact with the um, rocks. And we can use this up to the depth of around 80 meters. Uh, and in this case, we don't have the borehole itself and we are able to heat the, the fiber optic cable itself. Not the fiber, but the cable, meaning that we can pass the current through the uh, steel part, through, through the steel coating of the fiber optic cable, and at the same time monitor temperature inside with the fibers. So here you can see all of your bores placed in the cables in the field, 
and uh, here is just the, the surface so where we have this electrical cable connected uh, to the fiber optic cable and then basically we just uh, heat the cable itself at the depth in the ground. Uh, there is a recent paper by Simon who adapted also analytical solution in order to um, interpret this kind of experiments. And basically, based on the temperature increase that we measured during the heating, uh, we can deduce both uh, distribution of fluxes and also a distribution of thermal properties. So we performed these experiments um, for the first time in uh, Bordeaux, in the university campus, where um, there is an uh, aquifer thermal energy storage uh, site, which is developed in order to heat the building, the campus, and cool down the building and the campus. And we wanted basically to perform this method in order to characterize the site in terms of hydraulic properties and thermal properties before uh, the installation of the borehole for geothermal project. So an example of the data is here. So we have the borehole depth. Uh, not the borehole, sorry, but so the cable uh, depth up to 36 meters. And we heat it for two hours and a half. No, even more, three hours. And what we can see is that uh, so the temperature goes up and sometimes it stabilizes at some depths and at some depths it's not so hot. And then we can deduce, so it's just preliminary results, so then we can interpret this temperature change and this analytical solution, and uh, for every depth we can obtain temperature, uh, thermal conductivity, and also flux. So it works pretty well in some environments, like in porous median and unconsolidated aquifers. So to conclude, what I want to say is that in both uh, cases, in case of fractured media, in case of boreholes and in case of porous media and uh, direct push installation, we are able to detect thermal, uh, thermal properties very well with a relatively simple analytical solutions. We also can characterize and quantify groundwater flow in porous media if we are in direct contact with the media. In porous media, we can detect fractures. We can detect fracture connections in some cases when the fractures are permeable enough. <clears throat> but the problem is that uh, because the resolution of the DTS system, as you said, is close to 50 centimeters, so even a little bit more, uh, basically it's not comparable with the real process that could happen in fractured media. So in fractured media, the flow is localized at one centimeter interval or even one millimeter, and it's not comparable to the resolution of the system. So basically, we cannot really use uh, fiber optic in order to quantify groundwater flow. <clears throat> and another problem that we can uh, handle is the free convection. So if you have a borehole and if it's uh, big enough, and if you heat uh, too much, you can create the free convection in the borehole and you can have this convective cells that uh, basically move the hot water upwards. And in this case, you can perturb a lot the measurements of temperature or whatever, of chemistry, temperature in this case. And uh, you need to uh, uh, compress it somehow. So what we did uh, together with John uh, several years ago is that we tried to put the polyacrylamide uh, grains, polyacrylamide gel inside the borehole. So this is how it looks like. We have these small grains. We add water or we simply put it to the borehole and then it's wall. And uh, then it basically blocks, it creates some kind of porous media, which is very similar thermal properties to the water. And then we can still conduct our experiments uh, with heating the borehole, but without uh, creating this free convection. So it works pretty well. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Hope you're still here. We have time for questions and uh, any, any questions for Maria? Maria, could you tell us roughly what kind of heating system you were using and what, uh, how much did that add to the, I'll say the logistics of the experiment? Um, you mean in porous media when we heat the cable? Yes. Yeah, we have the power controller. Uh, we have one from um, Silixa. Uh, so it's a big box. 
that allows us to control the, the current and to measure and to control the resistivity that we have and to make it very safety and uh, for the equipment and also for us. Uh, because if you have a long cable, then basically you have a lot of resistivity and you need to eject uh, a lot. Yeah, I just lost the connection. And, yes, and so, that, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, just another comment on that is that sea temps, if anyone needs to heat cable, we have uh, heating systems that we rent to people as well. So uh, if people need to do heating. I also have rent. one from you. We also use it sometimes, yes. What's that? We also have one uh, system from you, so we also use it from time to time. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Maria? So super interesting. One of the things that I think, Maria, I don't know if you talked about, is that if you put a well in and you um, look at the temperature profile, you can also deduce the, the thermal uh, conductivity of the material by looking at, at, dis, uh, at, at, at kind of the variability of temperature as you go up. So the gradient in temperature gives you the inverse of the thermal conductivity. So you, we, you, when you want, if you want to understand the layering stratigraphy of a site, you put your cable down the well, and then looking at the temperatures, you can invert for the thermal conductivity of the rock and in that way see different stratigraphy. Mm -hmm. and I think uh, yeah. um, so, and Maria's data kind of suggested that as well. So that's really a, a useful way to see some geology too. Yeah.